I'm now going to sort of take a little step through the Eigen key and quite how it works. The 3D Eigen keys, uh, they're very sensitive. They have better than a micron of resolution, and we're going to return to that in a little while. They're fast, they're read every 500 microseconds in all four axes, and they're tough. We tested these out to over a million full cycles. That's full depression cycles to the maximum strain of the spring. And one of the things about this design is it's contactless and has no moving and wearing parts. The only moving part is a flexing stainless steel spring that we spent two years developing. We spent six months doing finer element modeling the stress patterns in the curves. So it was difficult. And uh, the first keys only lasted 20,000 presses. That surprisingly would have probably taken you out to a year of playing but you would have started to see wear as a professional player after a year with occasional key failures. It's a bit like guitar strings, basically. Um, and I wasn't happy about that, so we, didn't, we went to a lot of effort. It's a special alloy steel that's made for us in Sweden, um, especially milled for us. Um, high tensile alloy steel, and it's complicated. I think it's probably the short description for a very large amount of engineering effort. And you can see it in, in front of you. If you take the little plastic bucket-shaped thing out of the back, you're probably going to actually want to have that in your hands as we go through that. You can see the spring in there on the top. It's quite a complicated shape, and all of that stuff was non-trivial. You'll be glad to know, in the two years of selling Eigen Harps now, and there's a lot of these Eigen keys out there in the world being played, some of them are quite hard, some have been on tour, being played for three or four hours a day, and some of you players actually have hammered them as well. Um, we haven't had a single field failure of a key. So. The principal wearing component of our instrument seems to have survived. It did go through an epic engineering process to make sure it did, but we seem to have done that well, and I, it's, it's a pleasing thing as a consequence. Let's take apart an Eigenhart Pico. Now, this, as I say, is going to be a bit of an engineering discussion. We're going to start with what a Pico looks like. This is engineering drawings of a Pico, and then we're going to strip off. You can see here we've taken the outside aluminium case off the instrument. And here you can see EMC clips that clip and bond the front case here to the back, and that basically gives you electromagnetic shielding, which enables it to pass all the European EMC tests, and also makes it very tough and robust against interference on stage. It's a full, fully shielded case, and this plastic molding inside is spray painted, with conductive paint on the inside, which is also bonded through these clips. You can see here the, this whole assembly pokes through the aluminum case at the front, so it's all put together from the back. We strip off the plastic cage, and you can see the keys all sitting on a circuit board, and you've got a little chunk of that circuit board from an alpha in front of you. And each key has got a rubber seal here, which you should also have in your bag, and then it's got a little upstand that plugs with a key on, that plugs into the moving shutter moment, uh, component. Here on the Pico, you can also see the breath controller um, sensor, which is a Honeywell sensor, and, and that's a bi-directional, high-precision, low PSI sensor. And we have here the mode keys, which are simple switch keys. Once again, they're rated to around about a million cycles. So I actually think these probably will last a million cycles because they're engineered to last a million cycles. I think our keys probably, because we're in, they're engineered to last a million cycles, which are full cycles depression cycles will probably go a good deal longer. So. Um, so you can see now here we've taken a slice down through a row of Eigen keys. So at the very bottom here you can see a light guide that's part of the optical system. You can then see the plastic molding which is the small plastic bucket that you actually see with the spring. And then there's a spring in the system here and then there is the rubber seal at the top and then the key top which clocks onto the top. And you have different key tops depending on whether you have plastic keys or wooden keys zoom in, see it a little bit more clearly. This is a photodiode. There are LEDs here and here. Photodiode responds to uh, light and produces an electrical signal. And these LEDs are bright red, very bright red LEDs. And this is a plastic component. You see, you probably have that little plastic component in your hands. It's a little prismatic piece of design. Um, took quite a long time to get right. Once again, optical modeling, year of design. There's an awful lot of serious engineering inside an icon harp when you use one and uh, it all goes together to make it work in the way it does. Here you can see the spring system cut through, and that's actually moulded into the plastic these days. We used to fix those in in various ways, but we had lots of failures, so we invested in tooling that actually cast the plastic right around the metal now. And then you have a pop-in key at the top. These can actually be popped out if you have a sharp tool. And this is a rubber seal that provides two functions in the key. It provides light sealing, well, three functions, in fact, light sealing. 
It's carbon loaded, so it helps to provide electromagnetic uh, sealing. Um, and it also, because it's carbon loaded to a certain degree, and this is quite a very important function, it provides a degree, degree of mechanical damping to the system. And these keys have a resonant frequency around about 1.2 kilohertz. And so if you were in a room with a very loud note, what would 1.2 kilohertz be? Quite high. You know, if you did that, then potentially your instrument would start to resonate. We've never had that happen, but uh, this helps to pre prevent that happening with a, with a damping function. And here you have a plastic light guide that brings the light from the board up to the surface where it pokes through the cave. This is a section through the system. It becomes easier and easier to see. There you can see the spring system going into the shutter. And that is actually a shutter. That's a black plastic box of a shutter. You can see that. Uh, if you look through the bottom before you pop your plastic light guide in, you can see that right through the bottom of the actual bucket system. Here is the light guide. There. And that is the photodiode. And these are the LEDs here and here. And this is the underlying board substrate. And this whole assembly is these days screwed into this board assembly. So. So you can see it's exploded here, that system. Um, these are just little bits capped on tape that we put on the side to help hold the rubber on when we make them. They're, point, they're not necessary after it's been manufactured, but uh, that's the rubber component, and this is the exploded key. So, and here is a system. You're now going to see it sort of stripped down to essentials. So that's the key, and that is the, the blue here is the light guide system. These are the LEDs, photodiode, and the plastic key system. The spring is now missing. And now you can see a diagram of the light pattern as it runs. So we light one of the LEDs in one of the corners. It bounces by total internal reflection across that. It goes across this gap. This is the linearizing curve here. So this actually turns the, what's that? It's a Lambertian emitter, an emitter. So it's a cosine curve of light coming out of the LED. This turns it into a um, parallel beam of light that goes across the gap. Parallelish. You know, it's, it's, but it is, it is pretty parallel, actually. It's one of those weird things. It's better than you think it would be. And then this also, by total internal reflection, reflects it onto the sensor here. So and it does it for all of these corners, and we're just seeing a view across one side of it. And then as the key comes down, you can see that the light beam is broken, and the value of the reading changes. And then as it's differentially pivoted over to one side, you can see one side is lighter and one side is darker, so that enables you to start to derive your role and your signals from the keys. And then the scanning pattern, this is looking down over the top of the thing, and you can see here we have the LEDs to one side and the photodiode in the middle, and the scanning pattern steps round all the way through, and it goes once round that loop every 500 microseconds for every key on the instrument continuously. And it does that whether you've got them up or down or whatever you're doing. So. The IQ specification is the resolution is to 11 bits, which to all you guys will actually have a meaning. Um, that's one part in 2048, that's right, isn't it, 11 bits, 2048. Uh, over 0.9 of a millimeter of travel after, after noise removal, that's after we've taken the noise out of all the sampling process. And that translates to around about 400 nanometers of resolution. This is a number at the AES that people didn't really believe, and only believed after I told them exactly how much effort we'd gone to to attain it, and it's actually a real number. So when you play your Eigenheart and you feel how sensitive it is, that's why it's sensitive. It's astonishingly sensitive. 400 nanometers is, is tiny. It really is tiny. It's, you couldn't see that detail with an optical microscope, or an old-fashioned optical microscope. You could with the modern ones. Um, and they're read at 500 micro, microseconds, so that's 2 gigahertz rate per axis. And that data rate, one of the great achievements we managed to do is preserved end-to-end. -end. It's all the way there until it, it reaches your agent. So it keeps bucketing in at a vast rate, making your life difficult as a software engineer. <laughs> but it's also what makes the instruments so astonishingly expressive. It's one of those things that when we turn that down, although theory said that you shouldn't notice it, you could feel it wasn't quite right. And actually, if we turned it up, we didn't notice. So it's one of those things we made it a bit better than you need to be, but not much. You, know, you wouldn't want to drop that by a factor of two because you'd really notice. So. And it's one of those things that sort of creep up on you noticing as well. It's a, it's a, a subtle difference, you know, between a, it's like the difference between a 44.1 CD and a 96K recording. It's, it's something that's there, but it takes a little while before you realize just how much nicer the 96K recording is. 
signal flow, both the alpha and the tau, you know some of this stuff, I'm sure, already, but just want to cover it again for interest's sake. The alpha and the tau both connect to base stations, and the base stations provide the power to the instrument, and the base stations, interestingly, also do a lot of signal processing, along with um, FPGAs in the instruments, and it's all in VHDL, and it is, we used to run this stuff in signal processors, uh, and then Phil, our electronics engineer at the time, spent two years coding all that stuff into VHDL, so it's now burned into silicon. And that's quite complicated, I think it's best to say. I don't really understand it. Jim's got his head around some of it, but not all of it. Uh, it's quite a complicated old system, isn't it? Um, so there's a big FPGA and a tower and, a bay and, an, and an alpha. And that also drives this four-wire transformer balance error correcting protocol, which runs down your wire. And that's a seriously sophisticated piece of data transfer. There's nothing else quite like it. It is error recovering without latency. So it's got sufficient room in each packet to do error recovery and retransmission for each packet. And it does that in a very short period of time, so you don't ever notice. In fact, the error rates we get on the cable are very, very low anyway, and so we virtually never get errors through the whole system. So we used to log them, but we just stopped bothering after a while. It doesn't seem to be worthwhile. Um, and it's balanced, so it's safe. It's also 24 volts up to the instrument, so the instrument's not going to electrocute you, and it's fully transformer isolated from the main. So I have a big fear of dying on stage. Well, I don't have a big fear, but people have died on stage from ele being electrocuted by electric guitars. I didn't really want an argon harp ever doing that. I figured it would kind of be a kiss of death. <laughs> you know, somebody falling over dead would probably not sell our instruments terribly well. So we were very, very cautious about that. And you will note that you can also power the base stations off 24 volts directly, uh, so you can have a very safe environment. And the base station talks to the host via USB 2. We're having some issues with USB 3 at the moment, aren't we, Jim? I think there's a couple of weird things that have popped up. But, uh, the Pico is driven directly from the PC, and that's why the key limit's there. The two things, the keys use a lot of power, because they're lighting those LEDs very bright. We flash them, but we flash them at about 60 milliamps for a very short pulse. So actually, the whole key system uses quite a lot of current. Uh, and also, the LEDs, the biggest user is, in fact, the lights on the front. They really, really power up. And USB only has 450 milliamps, really, of 5 volt power, so it's not very much. So we're kind of limited with that architecture. But it makes the Pico much cheaper, because we don't have to put an FPGA in there. It's got, there is no signal processing that goes on inside the actual Pico. Uh, 